Hi guys, my name is Omar and I'm the Grow Pastor here at The Crossing. Thanks for being here for our series, Win the Day. If you're looking for to find your people and explore faith, please reach out to me today. My email is ogarcia at thecrossing.com and I would love to help you find a great group of people that you can connect with. We also have small groups that meet weekly to support each other and grow together. If you're local, we have Groups Community Night on February 9th on campus at 6.30. We'd love to see you there. And now, let's talk about how you can win the day with our arts pastor, Nicole Romero. Hey everyone, my name is Nicole. Thanks for being here. If you are feeling burnt out and tired, this is for you. And if life feels kind of overwhelming, this is for you. If not, if you're feeling good today, then this will help you stay that way. We are talking today about the thing that drives our lives, that right-sizes our problems and gives us a reason to get up in the morning. It's where we put our affection and attention and trust. The best word we have for this is worship. What and how we worship shapes our lives. You know, I learned this week that if you condensed us down to just the matter in our atoms, kind of removed all the empty space in our cells, the entire human race would fit in a sugar cube. Sure, it would weigh like a few billion tons, but it is still amazing that when it comes to our actual mass and matter, the entire human race, we're only this big. That is amazing to me. So much in life is amazing. The universe, the balancing act that allows earth to sustain life, the way our senses work, that you can hear me right now across time and space in whatever your right now is. Our phones are amazing. And honestly, we barely notice. Like, life is busy and hard, and so we take so much for granted because we're just trying to make it through the day, to get to work on time, to find the doctor's office, to make something for dinner. But life is amazing. So I was born when we had to use paper maps to find our way. Did you ever use a Thomas guide? It's a relic. So I used a Thomas guide. But now I have a map in my phone that updates and tells me how long it will take to get somewhere with turn-by-turn -turn instructions. And my eyes can take in the pixels and information and make sense out of it without me even having to think about it. And then I get to use my magic moving phone map every single day. If I want to, I can even use it on my regular drive to work because it tells me if there's been an accident or something weird on my usual route. But even with this miracle of technology, I get super frustrated with my phone and I don't appreciate it most days. The other day, I was so mad because it tried to take me through a parking structure on my way to an event, which is really dumb. Why would I want to drive through a parking structure? And then it was wrong about how long a trip was going to take. It kept doing the thing where it says nine more minutes, but it says that for like five minutes straight. And I'm just so angry at my phone for not having it right. But luckily, I happened to be listening to a podcast while I was in my car and being late because my phone lied to me. And 
Did you know that time is relative? I probably knew that at some point, but I forgot. So as my phone is tracking me on the GPS, it is sending a message to a satellite in space to locate me on the Earth. The satellite and me have slightly different experiences of time because I am on Earth and going one speed, and the satellite is further from the Earth and its gravity and moving at a different speed. And speed and gravity affect the way you experience time. And yet I'm mad when my phone is off by a few minutes. It's a miracle in the first place. As comedian Louis C.K. famously said in 2016, everything is amazing and nobody is happy. See, here at The Crossing, we're in a series called Win the Day, where we are talking about habits and mindsets that help us actually be happy, even on our hardest days. Our acronym for this series is START, just START. So far, we have covered S, start by losing, T, take and read, and A, always worship. Today is always worship. We are made to worship. So I asked some of the Crossing's worship leaders what worship is and why it is important. Steve said, worship is a state of mind and a way of life. It's important because when we worship, we are acknowledging that there is something bigger and better outside of us that deserves to be praised. And then Kimi said, I view worship as honoring Jesus as my king, tuning my heart to his heart. It's important because worship is one of the most intimate ways God shapes us. It's a personal experience that connects our hearts to his as we allow him access to all the areas of our lives, decisions, rhythms, relationships, goals, vibes, always vibes. And then Carol said, worship is a response of the heart. It's important for us to worship God because we physically can't handle glory. Emotionally and physically, when we take glory that isn't ours, we experience the ugliness that the world offers. And Cassini said, worship is a combination of action and intention to show reverence and importance to God. It's important because what we center our lives around is super telling. It dictates our routines, our headspace, what we believe to be most important and worthwhile. Worship is a state of mind, a response of the heart. It is an action and an honoring of the right thing. It is being amazed and directing that amazement toward God in a way that shapes your whole life. But you may not be amazed by anything right now, let alone God. You may be nowhere near what it says in Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. That is the epitome of always worship, right? Praising God every day forever and ever. And if that feels a long way off for you right now, let's just see if we can find a path to it. There are these sections in the Bible where we get a glimpse of heaven, of what we are made for, and they are a good place to start. In Revelations 4, it shows us a moment of worship. Everyone is saying, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Now. What if we start with the things we find amazing and actually put them in that scripture? For example, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, including every worship leader I know, the people who made Google Maps, time itself, and me. And by your will, they were created and have their being. We start with the things we naturally find amazing and then follow that path to God. So today, my plan for us is that two-step process that you would experience more awe and wonder and amazement in your everyday life, and that that wonder would lead you to love and worship God. You know, the word worship comes from the old English word that means worth-ship. So when we worship, we are honoring God for all that He is worth. I love what worship leader Darlene Check says, our lives are changed forever when we worship God for all He is worth with all we are worth. And how each of us learn to see God's worth, how we each gain more awe and experience God is different. 
in the last section of our time together, we're going to talk about what author Gary Thomas calls the nine sacred pathways. Some people call it the worship languages because you are uniquely made. And up until now, you may have thought of worship as just singing worship music, but there are more pathways to worship than just music. And no one is better than any other. And to show you what I mean, I need to first tell you a story about a businesswoman and a prison guard. So in a book in the Bible called Acts, in chapter 16, we meet both a businesswoman named Lydia and a prison guard. Lydia is a wealthy businesswoman. She lives in a big city in what is now Europe, and she trades in high fashion. She's a leader in her community. She loves to host people in her beautiful home, and she doesn't just come from a formal religious background. We don't know exactly what she comes from, but she'd be like somebody at the crossing. She's a faith explorer who has a sense that maybe God is real. And so one day, she goes down to the river where the Romans are allowing the Jewish people to worship their God. Now, she's not Jewish. Maybe she's just curious and wants to see what the Jewish people do to worship their God. There she meets a Christian pastor named Paul and his friend Silas. They've been down at the river telling people about Jesus. And we don't know if anyone else really listened, but Lydia did. It says, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. She and her entire household believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and were baptized that day. Then she invited everyone, including Paul and Silas, to her house for food and more worship. But a few days later, Paul and Silas are arrested. They're beaten and they're taken to a Roman prison. There's a guard there. Now this poor guy, he has seen it all. He has seen the worst of humanity. He is tough. And he is instructed to watch Paul and Silas carefully. So he puts them in an inner cell, he shackles their feet, and then that night, Paul and Silas are praying and singing to worship God in their cell. The other prisoners are listening to them, and the jailer is trying to sleep. And the next thing you know, there is a huge earthquake. All the prison doors open and everyone's shackles fall off. And the guard is terrified about the earthquake and about the prisoners being freed. He grabs his sword to kill himself before his bosses can do it for him. But then Paul shouts, don't hurt yourself. We are all still here. The guard can't believe it. He throws himself at their feet and asks, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. And the guard and his household believe. And Paul and Silas are released from prison shortly after. And you know, they go back to Lydia's house before moving on to a new city. It says, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Now, we don't know for sure, but some Bible teachers like to think that the prison guard stopped by Lydia's that night. She was a great host and it would have been his last chance to see Paul and Silas. And so we imagine the two of them there. And if you've ever felt like other people's experiences of God are better than yours or different and you wonder why, pay special attention to these two people, Lydia, who went down to the river because she was curious and exploring faith, who heard Paul talking about Jesus and God just opened her heart. And then the prison guard, a man hardened by life, sleeping through worship, who believes in Jesus because of a terrifying near-death experience, an earthquake, and nearly losing everything. You can imagine the guard walking up to Lydia at her house. Nice to meet you. Thanks for hosting this party. So what was your moment like? Why did you say yes to Jesus? And she says, well, Paul was talking about Jesus and I don't know, it just all made sense. It was so cool. I just, I knew I was supposed to go down to the river that day. And the guard says, what? There was no earthquake? The walls didn't crash around you? You didn't feel like killing yourself? She's like, no, nothing like that. And you can imagine both of their points of view. The guard thinking, wow, I'm kind of worried about Lydia. I'm not sure she really knows Jesus. She hasn't had like a big experience. And then Lydia may be thinking, wow, that guy is super dramatic about Jesus. I hope he doesn't just like the emotion of it. Can you see? She's amazed by Paul's simple teaching by the river. He is amazed by the earthquake and the prisoners who didn't escape. 
different people with different experiences, but both being amazed and letting that amazement turn into worship of Jesus. Everything is amazing. Start with what you see naturally. So now, let's talk about the nine sacred pathways. Here are some road rules as we go down this. Number one, choose the path you find amazing and let it lead you to God. Don't worship the path itself. Watch for dangers on the path. And don't stick to only path one forever. So let's do it. Let's talk about the nine ways we uniquely interact with the world and worship God. So here we go. Worship languages. The naturalist, the sensate, the traditionalist, the ascetic, the activist, the caregiver, the enthusiast, the contemplative, and the intellectual. So first, the naturalist. You are a naturalist if you feel clear-headed and rested and amazed and most alive when you are in nature. Trees and streams and open sky, the beach, the ocean. You can watch birds swoop and fly. You can sit in Yosemite and be in awe. Naturalists experience wonder and worship through nature. If you are a naturalist, put up pictures of your favorite places on earth. Go for a walk a couple times a day. Take yourself to nature. Your pathway to wonder and to worship is not something to ignore or be shy about or put off. This is how you will hear God best. Romans 1.20 is a great verse for you. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature. So they have no excuses for not knowing God. Now, the danger for naturalists is the temptation to stop at appreciating creation, to worship creation rather than the creator. So remember to let your love of nature be a path to loving and worshiping God. Then the sensate. Sensates feel joyful, odd, connected to life when their senses are lit up. You Looking at the lines of an amazing work of art, tasting fresh baked bread, feeling the softness of a brand new sweatshirt, smelling a favorite candle. If you are a sensate, take it all in. Be amazed at the taste of honey. Walk through Restoration Hardware, touching all the fancy leather couches. Listen to amazing music and thank God for each thing. It is honoring to God that you appreciate what your senses experience. A verse like Psalm 119, 103 is great for you. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The danger for sensates is worshiping the sensations over God, to focus on the food, the art, the stuff, rather than God. It can turn to hedonism and gluttony, so you'll need to practice moderation in some of your sensory experiences and keep them in their right place as just a path to worshiping the God who created everything. Use your senses to grow closer to God rather than just to sate yourself. The traditionalist. Traditionalists love rituals, symbols, and traditions. Knowing you are part of something that people have been doing for years and years, maybe reliving things from your childhood or doing something your family has done for generations. If you are a traditionalist, pick a couple traditions and keep them going. Maybe you say the same prayer each day before breakfast. Maybe you sing a song your grandma loved and you sing it on her birthday. Maybe you watch a service at the same time each week. You wear a necklace with a cross or a symbol that means something to you. Repetition and symbolism create awe in you and will connect you to God. A great verse for you could be the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. You could say it every day, knowing it has been said for thousands of years. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The danger for a traditionalist is that those traditions can start to turn into rules. It's tempting to start thinking that's the best and only way to do things, or the rituals or symbols can become empty and habitual. Remember that those things are meant to be pathways to God. They are not God. The ascetic. The ascetic loves silence and solitude. Mm, to get away from the noise of life, to be alone, is bliss. You do not need podcasts or music or people or puppies to keep you company. You feel clear-headed and good when it is quiet and you are alone. You, If you are an ascetic, it is okay to shut everything out and make time for quiet, 
to schedule in time for it. Maybe get up early, sit in your car for a minute before you go in the house. A great first for you is be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The danger for the ascetic is in isolation. We are made for community and relationship, to serve others. So take your time alone and use it to connect with God. If you're doing that, also listen because God will speak to you in the quiet and remind you when it is time to get back out there. Now the activist, activists feel energized and purposeful when they are in the fight, working against injustice. If you just can't sit still while there is injustice and politicians are lying, you are probably an activist. If you are an activist, sign the petitions, write letters to your representatives, and choose somewhere to volunteer. Volunteer with our homeless ministry or team up with us to bring access to clean water to all of El Salvador. Activists, email Josh Carmen, our outreach pastor, right now, and he will give you something meaningful to do. A great verse for you is, Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. The danger for the activist is it is tempting to lose sight of the good in life, of God's grace, of the souls on the other side of the fight who also need Jesus. While you can hate evil, you cannot hate people. Now the caregiver. Caregivers, they care about people. Sitting down with a hurting friend, welcoming someone new into your home, taking care of kids. While the activist wants to march in the streets to stop the suffering of children, you want to hold that child and give them something good to eat. If you are a caregiver, be proud. Often caregivers work from a place of feeling like other people are more important, but it is a gift to be a caregiver. They're not more important than you, but your care makes them important. Let each glass of water you pour be a gift, not just to that person, but to the God who created them and loves them too. Remember this verse. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The danger of a caregiver is that the needs of people are a black hole. It never ends. You can feel hopeless. You can give your whole life to the care of others and never care for yourself. It can also be really difficult to prioritize who to care for. So make sure you put your top people first and remember that you are not the savior of the world. It is good to still set boundaries. The enthusiast. Okay, enthusiasts are looking for experiences that go beyond the normal. They want mystery and celebration and emotion and drama. They want to be swept away by the music. The moment is just bliss. It's the meaning of life. You live with enthusiasm and you are looking for things that kindle your enthusiasm. If you are an enthusiast, we need you. But we can't be you. So bring your enthusiasm, go after those experiences, but don't let it get you down when other people can't match you. Like all these worship languages, no one is better than any of the others, but we need them all. We need you enthusiasts to remind others that it's okay to fully express yourself. When enthusiasts worship, they show on the outside what it means to put your whole self into something. A great Bible story for you is David in 2 Samuel chapter 6, where he just refuses to rein it in. It says, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. The danger for enthusiasts is that the experiences can be addicting. It's easy to chase the emotional high rather than the God we are actually learning to worship. Practice the other paths too, to keep God at the center, not a feeling at the center. The contemplative. Contemplatives love to ponder the mysteries and complexities of life. You never get bored because there's too much to enjoy pondering. Maybe you like meditation, prayer, watching lava in a lava lamp. If the tasks of life bug you, but you can watch a bug walk for like an hour, you are probably a contemplative. And if you are a contemplative, dive into the depths, swim out into the sea of wonder. You can set time aside to accomplish nothing and know that it is time well spent. Join a prayer team, choose a topic to contemplate, and then write a little about it and share it with a friend. 
Your ability to hold complex and competing concepts in a peaceful way is really needed. Let the meaning and beauty you see be a path to God, who is the most beautiful of all. As Psalm 27, 8 says, My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. The danger for the contemplative is inaction and loving your own thoughts and research more than what needs to get done, the people who need help, or the God beyond your own understanding. So make time to serve others in tangible ways and make a to-do list of a couple things you must do each day. Finally, the intellectual. Intellectuals love to learn. Make me think more. Teach me something new. Studying? Yes, please. I love it. Intellectuals are looking for mental challenges and interesting facts. If you are an intellectual, I don't need to tell you that we need you. You know we need you. So find a good study Bible. When you hear a sermon, look up the Bible verses yourself. Are you doing the 90-day reading plan? Because you definitely should be. Learn more about science to appreciate how God designed the universe. Research what life was like at the time a part of the Bible was written. Let your intellectual curiosity bring you closer to God. Here's one scripture for you, but you probably already know more than this one. I rejoice in following your statutes, as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. The danger for intellectuals is getting tricked into thinking that knowing about God is the same as knowing God. Practicing the other worship styles will deepen your relationship with God as you learn about God. Now, we can be like toddlers on Christmas morning with these gifts. We can end up playing with the box and the wrapping rather than the gift inside. God's love and power and grace, forgiveness and leadership are inside that gift, inside that language. God's presence is the best gift we will ever receive. Your life is meant to be more than numb, frustrated days all in a row. Make time to be amazed. Start with what comes naturally and then build on it. Use the magic of your phone or the worship language that you most fluently speak to start and to build a life where you always worship. Holocaust survivor Abraham Heschel says it this way, our goal should be to live life in radical amazement. Get up in the morning and look at the world in a way that takes nothing for granted. Everything is phenomenal. Everything is incredible. Never treat life casually. To be spiritual is to be amazed. We were made. The earth and everything on it. The stars that are built of the same things as us. The only reason any of us are breathing is because God willed it. Life is amazing. And for me, the leap to believing it is all an accident is bigger than the leap to believing it is all on purpose. So we leap and believe in a God who is better than the best thing we can think of because he made all of it. The entire human race fits in a sugar cube. God is God and we are not. Follow the amazement in your life. Follow your pathway toward worship. Put God at the center and see how your life changes. The essence of worship is to know God and then respond to his greatness. He is not asking for worship. He is just worthy of it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the different ways that you have made us, the uniqueness of each human being. Just looking at each other should help us realize that you are real and you are amazing. God, I pray for everyone who is listening that you would help them understand how they can best connect with you that they would feel permission in their hearts to go after amazement and that that amazement would lead them to you, to worshiping you, the one who made everything. Thank you for this day. God, would you give us lives full of worship? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you guys for being here with me. So I have a special treat for you, actually. We usually go right into a worship song, but we as a church have a new worship leader that I want to introduce you to, and then I want him to introduce the song that we're gonna bring to you next. All right, here we go. 
All right, hey everybody, I get to introduce you to Troy Lee. Hello, Troy Lee. Hello, Nicole. Thank you for being here, for sure. you guys. This guy is an answer to prayer. He is our new worship pastor, and we are so glad to have you here. Thank you. So would you tell everybody just a little bit about yourself and your family? Yep, yep. my name is Troy. As Nicole mentioned earlier, I'm married to my wife, Olivia, and we've been married for seven years. We have two sons named Sailor and Silas, who are four and one. We're from the Sacramento, California area, but now we're down here in the beautiful OC. So good, been to the beach like every day. Every single day. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so I asked Troy to answer those same two questions that, that I quoted the other worship leaders answering a little bit ago, which is, what is worship to you? Mm -hmm. And then why is it important? Yeah, so worship to me is what I find in Romans 12, 1, and it says to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And I believe that's everything that we do in our lives that brings glory to God. So we can either bring glory to God in every circumstance, or we can decide to not bring glory to God. But our worship is when we bring glory to God in those circumstances. That's so good. And yeah. then why is that important? Yeah, that's important to me because it shifts kind of who we are and how we view God. Mm -hmm. And the way that we view Him in our lives is, is the way we glorify Him. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I asked him also to choose which song we're going to sing and listen to today in this service. So what worship song did you pick and why? I chose Reckless Love because it's one of my first songs that I really felt the congregation was was on board with mm -hmm. as leading worship. And also, it's one of the songs that just encompasses the Father's heart as He's pursuing us daily. So, Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you, Troy. Just a little bit to get to know him. You'll see lots of him in the future. And now here's Reckless Love. spoken word you were singing over me you've been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you've been so so kind to me Climb up 
coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me Thank you so much for being here. We are gonna win the day, one day at a time. I wanna take a moment to share with you some of the exciting things that are happening here at The Crossing. On January 17th, we started reading the entire New Testament as a church. Reading the Bible can sometimes feel a little frustrating and intimidating when we don't know what to read or even when, where to start. With this provided reading plan, you will know exactly what to read each and every day. And it doesn't matter if you're new to faith reading the Bible for the first time, or if you've read the Bible regularly, this reading plan is designed with everyone in mind. And it's not too late to sign up and jump in. Go to thecrossing.com slash 90 day. You'll get support and you can join our community page and meet others taking up the challenge to read. At TC, we're committed to being a community of growth and support. We wanna help you find your people and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus this year. We have a new season of groups starting in a couple of weeks, and we're gonna be launching weekend service groups, Alpha and Financial Peace University. So whether you wanna go deeper with your faith, you wanna uh, go deeper with the weekend messages, or become more financially sound, we are gonna help you find a group that is perfect for you. If you're interested in this, we have more details, and you can email me at groups at thecrossing.com. So once again, groups at thecrossing.com. And so I'd love to be able to find the perfect group for you. And if you're local, we have a community night for groups on February 6th at 6.30 p.m. Come join us for the start and launch of our winter small group semester with some delicious food and fun. We will have an opportunity to meet some of the small group leaders and jump into a small group that's perfect for you. You will also get to meet some of the other amazing people that call The Crossing their home. Finally, I wanna take a moment and thank all of you who support The Crossing. The ways that you volunteer your time and give donations to, to this place makes a difference. Last year, we saw so many lives change because of your gifts. And this year, maybe you're ready to become a regular investor in The Crossing. You could set up a reoccurring gift each month or give regularly. And so whether you wanna set up a regular giving or give for the first time, you can go to thecrossing.com slash give to make your donation. Thanks for being here. Don't let your faith exploration stop here take a next step. Whether it's the reading challenge, joining a small group, or making a donation, this is the year that you move forward and take your next step. 
We'll see you online all the time and on Sundays on campus at 9.15 a.m. or 11.15 a.m. for the Win the Day series. Thank <laughs> you.